Okay, good afternoon. It's Pop again, Dennis Murray. Uh, today is a podcast 90, yay for me. And it's called Nature's Wisdom, part 40. And it's very late in the afternoon. I've been working hard on this uh, all last uh, afternoon and evening and all this morning. Uh, the... Uh, The things I talked about yesterday and those books led me into uh, some wonderful thinking. And I came up with some general uh, patterns that I, I really hadn't seen before. And uh, I, I, I want to uh, talk a, a little bit about the specific books that I was reading. But um, uh, the patterns are more in my own mind. Uh, these books help stimulate me to it. Um, this is a book by a person called Mircea Eliad. He was a professor of religion, of the history of religion, uh, at Chicago, and he was, um, you know, a biggie. Um, this is one of a number of books he wrote. It's called The Sacred and the Profane. These aren't scribbles uh, of a little kid on the cover. That's the artwork um, that uh, is on the book. And uh, as it happens, I'm happy to note that when I read this book uh, 10 or 15 years ago, I, I made a, a lot of notes in detail. And uh, so I was able to skim through the book pretty quickly and be refreshed. And that, uh, along with this uh, book, which we've spoken about before, The Essential, uh, sorry, uh, Common Sense Spirituality uh, by a person whose name I'm going to have to uh, pronounce uh, with the best German I can manage. His name is David. Okay, so we got that one easy. But his last name is S-T-E-I-N-D-L hyphen. R A S T Stendelrast, and uh, so okay. Uh, I believe he's already in the notes uh, of the description of one of the podcasts way back when when I first talked about him. Um, go go to Common Sense Spirituality on Amazon, and you'll find his book. Uh, and uh, it's a really really uh, amazing book. The guy has. Uh, a wonderful spirituality. I'm just deeply impressed. In, in all honesty, I'm not easily impressed about spiritual matters. Um, it does help that he's a Benedictine monk. Uh, I had Benedictine monks in my high school, and I've always had the highest admiration and respect for them. Their, uh, uh, the motto of their order of monks is Ora et Labora, work and pray. And uh, I kind of like the idea of the balance involved. And their monastic life is, is a combination. They usually uh, run a school, of, uh, typically uh, a Benedictine monastery quite often does. And the monks work as teachers in the school. And there's also some who work um, in the fields uh, quite often. Uh, and uh, and some who go out and teach in nearby universities, uh, you know, and bring their income back to the monastery. Um, it's you know, these are extraordinary people, and uh, they have much to commend their way of life, regardless. So I then you know followed my usual pattern. Uh, uh, I went to uh, uh, look on Amazon and Wikipedia and uh, YouTube for. Um, information about how these writers have been received, and particularly for um, Mircea Eliad, I was able to find a whole wealth of stuff. And um, uh, part of it has led me to this notion that I'm going to use as a, a general beginning here. Um, we have a fair amount of chaos in our current lives. Uh, you know, some chaos is normal, it's part of life, but uh, we, we have more than is good for us. And um, the way to help that is to find 
some patterns uh, in ourselves, in our situation in the in the universe, um, that uh, give us uh, a little more uh, sense of how things go together, a little more sense of order, a, a little more confidence and trust in the universe that we're grateful to be alive in, uh, but we find a bit baffling. And also uh, from uh, patterns, we can get a better idea of how we can live together in such a way that many more of us have a sense of a well-lived life. And, um, you know, our young people are, are then born into families where there's a strong sense of a well-lived life as the characteristic of, uh, you know, that family and of the neighborhood. And uh, we have a lot fewer uh, families where uh, desperate financial circumstances are being ignored by others. Um, uh, we have a lot more connection uh, to each other, a lot more uh, generosity, uh, things that seem to be an ancient part of our uh, of our evolved psychology. I mean, we, we began being altruistic as the first and only species to do that, um, you know, two million years ago in our ancestor species. And uh, until, you know, three, four thousand years ago, um, uh, well, you have to go back a little beyond that, until maybe 10, 15,000 years ago, uh, we lived in small groups and altruism was the norm of the day, coupled with the usual problems of dealing with the slacker and the, and the uh, guy with the uh, inflated sense of himself, uh, the big man. Um, so we're living in a circumstance that we really are not evolved to live in, and we we feel it. We feel a bit at odd with ourselves, our our relation to our own interior self, our relation to um, those around us, and our relation to the physical earth that we live on. Um, we certainly are doing great harm to the earth and to our own great detriment, and we seem to not have any uh, relatively uh, uh, profound grasp of uh, how not to do that, how to arrange things so that uh, typically we are not uh, harming the universe we live in, uh, that we are uh, being good stewards of it. So I think we would like to gain back a sense of community, a sense of, of being good stewards, a sense of having an understanding of uh, how what a well-lived life looks like. Um, and it's not just, you know, this is nostalgia. We want to go back to 100 years ago. Um, this is a much older problem than 100 years ago. Um, this predates, uh, you know, um, this problem really began, uh, you know, eight, 10,000 years ago with agriculture and the accumulation of uh, uh, large groups of us and then empires, etc. And, you know, vast changes then in inequality of wealth and inequality of power and um, the, the the great reduction in ability to tell who was a slacker who should be kicked in the butt you know um, and uh, how to help his kids anyway and um, who was the loud mouth that needed to be uh, you know brought uh, back to a little more humility uh, and th those things became very, very difficult because we're dealing in such large numbers and it's hard to get a reliable read on those things. And it's very, very difficult to make public policy through laws instead of through the good heart of the people. And we have lost connection to our good heart. Um, we all have souls uh, in our psychology, but many, many of us have turned away from the soul uh, in in the, in the last three thousand years or so in Western civilization, uh, because uh, we were busy in, during the dis doing the distancing that's required to take full use of our newly evolved powers of being objective, and 
So we have acquired these wonderful powers of being objective, which allow us to feed and clothe vast populations, unheard of in the history of the world, um, but at a price of not uh, ha having the closeness uh, th uh, that we need in order to be able to live together in the face of death, hate, necessity, and unfairness. So we gain the facility for midday the world for using our gifts for uh, uh, distancing ourselves from the world and being objective. And, uh, but we gained it at a price of alienating ourselves from uh, within. And, and within is where we find the sense of connection to others, oddly enough. Look in and you're led to others uh, as well as to your own self. You can't be whole as a person without being led to others, and you can't be led to others if you're not whole as a person. Those two things are related to each other. And, of course, nobody's ever perfect in either of them, but they go with each other. And if you are really unconnected to within, you've got a problem relating. And um, uh, if you're very distant, you're with, with your own within, with your own inner, uh, spirituality because you 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 think of the spirituality as a thing of religion and religion can't be proven so it has no role in the objective and you're trying above all to use the objective because look at the miracles it performs uh, and in so doing you lose the miracles the true miracles that the sacredness in us performs in making our whole lives meaningful and in making our relation to each other rich and vibrant and uh, and frankly just extraordinarily wonderful and a great comfort to an old man as he goes toward the end of his years. And so a huge price has been paid and if we look at it and say, okay, lessons learned, uh, you know, we, we had this newly developed facility to use analytical intelligence and it required us to be distant. And in the process, we lost our sense of connection to ourselves while gaining the facility to manipulate uh, the world around us. Um, and now that we see the price we've paid, we see a new pattern that shows us the price we've paid and we can begin to see by this notion that our psychology gives us the sacred and that it's not religion, it's the source of religion. And uh, that whether or not there's an external God, uh, there is um, a, a, a genuine uh, sacredness in, and soulfulness in the heart of our psychology that we cannot live without and that we have to nourish in order to thrive and that we have to share. It turns out that the energy of hope that arises from within us and needs to be shared um, in order to be able to help us get past death, hate, necessity, and unfairness. Uh, and so the the point is that I'm proposing in a broad sense, recognizing a pattern and that alone reduces chaos and brings us back to um, a deeper relationship with ourselves and with each other that we can share in our personal and in our communal lives. So we can reintroduce soulfulness and sacredness into our communal lives without offending at all the gifts of analytical uh, objective intellect, which says, well, uh, okay, uh, so long as, you know, I thought these things were religious and I don't see enough evidence for religion, for, uh, you know, for a deity. Uh, so I didn't have any call for them. I didn't have any use of them. I didn't have any respect for them. 
But now I can see that these things are part of our evolved psychology that using our intellect has helped us discover. So now let's use the gifts of our discovery. These are precious. These will ease the chaos. These will restore our connection to each other. These will, once again, uh, give uh, huge comfort and meaning uh, to the community so that all of the children in their family, in their school, in the community will get the sense of love and connection they need, even if the individual parents aren't the best. And uh, uh, in this way, we also gain uh, um, the sense of the sacredness of the world that's been given us to live in so that we can resume being stewards of the Earth's wholesomeness. And so as I see this, this is a really, really good way to carry on between now and, and uh, episode 100 uh, in the next, you know, 10 days here. Um, um, to see what we've been talking about, nature's wisdom, as a new way of, of seeing order that brings an enormous uh, satisfaction, a great grounding in our own selves, and a reduction of chaos. And, in, and it turns out that the mere fact of explaining how things came to be um, has mythical power. It has a wondrous healing power. It, it, it is a, a gift in this instance of our um, uh, objective uh, intellectual abilities. They're the ones that discovered. That's the thing that helped us discover our um, anthropology and our, our uh, evolutionary uh, history and uh, to see how much uh, the sacred is evolved in our psychology. Um, so that let's put that gift to use. Let's thank the scientific, intellectual, objective side of our lives for this enormous contribution. And then let's put it into use so that we can see that science and religion are absolutely not enemies that are actually holding hands together. Uh, one, bringing an appreciation of soul back, you know, uh, in, in our psychology, so that religion can see that it's born from the soulfulness that science has discovered in us, that it's born from the sense of sacred that science has discovered in us. And religion can then continue to believe that that was put there by an external deity uh, using the, uh, the um, facility of evolution to evolve our psychology so that we would be able to uh, not only have this sense of the sacred in us, but recognize it as having been a gift from an external deity. And, um, uh, and those of us that don't believe in an external deity still can see that we all share soulfulness, we all share the sacred. It is in our psychology. And it doesn't offend anyone who doesn't believe in an external deity that some do believe in an external deity because all believe that our psychology contains this marvelous, really um, uh, miraculous uh, capacity to generate uh, the energy of hope and um, the, the lead us to be a gift to each other. So that's what we're going to develop in coming days. I'm going to talk more about the specific writings in these books and several others. I'm going to talk more about scripture and its derivation. Um, lots of wonderful discoveries uh, to talk about. And uh, I think we'll have a really exciting uh you know, uh, 10 days. Uh, and I'm going to just do one day for the, uh, the summary of all 100 uh, podcasts uh, because I want to be able to 
force myself to get to the point quick, more quickly than normal. <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.